Genesis 48. And uh, we have Bibles over there if you've, um, if you've come without your Holy Writ. And uh, so either turn to the page or scroll down on whatever electronic device you have. And it sounds like a rabbi, doesn't it? He scrolls down to find the word. And we'll read uh, Genesis 48. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours and the territory they inherit they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. As I was returning from Paddan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, Who are these? They are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, Bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh on his left towards Israel's right hand and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head and though he was the younger and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the name, names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you, as one who is over your brothers, I give the ridge of land I took from the Ammonites with my sword and my bow. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of his word, a father who leaves a blessing to his sons. Good evening. If you have a Bible in front of you, do keep it open there at chapter 48 of Genesis. Let's pray together as we come before God's word. 
Father in heaven, we do pray that you would speak to us tonight and we thank you for your holy and inspired word that stands before us and we ask, Lord, that you might lead us to yourself perfectly and fully through it and that you might show us more and more the work of the Lord Jesus on our behalf and how you have given us every good thing in him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a few weeks since we've been in, um, in Genesis, and it's worth just reminding ourselves that we're, we're coming into the, the final stretch, really, of the Joseph story. We're into these last three chapters. Remember, Joseph had gone ahead of his brothers, sent at the human level by their own hand and their treachery down into Egypt, where God had raised him up to be very important, to be at the right hand of Pharaoh, And then during this time of famine that came on the land of Egypt and to all the surrounding lands to be a savior. And in the chapters beforehand, he had brought the whole family down now to be with him in Egypt and to rescue them from the famine. And as we get towards the end of the story, it really very much concerns Jacob, his father, who is now dying. Remember, Jacob had come down with the rest of the family, born on carts, sent by Pharaoh, And he'd been worried at the time, will I actually make it? Will I get to see my son again? In fact, he made it and he lives for 17 years, we find, in the land of Egypt. And yet here now, he's about to die. And this blessing of of Ephraim and Manasseh that becomes before the blessing of the 12 tribes next week very much connects in with that death of Jacob. Look down at verse 1. After this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So it connects with these final events about the death of Jacob. Also, as one goes on in the Bible story, you can see that chapter 48 has an important role to play in explaining the shape of the Old Testament. Jacob had 12 sons, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. And yet Joseph, who's been so important in the story here, Well, there's no tribe named after him. In fact, as we learn here, his sons get those tribal names, Ephraim and Manasseh. Joseph in the story is promoted to be the firstborn, even though he's not the firstborn. He gets a double share of the inheritance by Jacob blessing and giving a full share to each of Joseph's first two sons and taking them as, as if they're his very own sons. And so that concerns some of the process here. It's a kind of ancient Near Eastern adoption process that we can see in other cultures as well. Grandparents could take children, uh, grandchildren, to be as if they were their own sons for reasons of inheritance. So there's a kind of an explanatory story of Israel function here in chapter 48. But there's more than just history here. As we read through the story, we see that these blessings that Jacob is pronouncing on Ephraim and Manasseh are the blessings, and this all concerns the blessings to do with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's handing on these family blessings. And if that's true, and if that's what the passage is speaking of, then it's directly relevant to us as Christians. As the New Testament says, what the Lord Jesus Christ did was to give us by faith in him, these promised things, promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, these promised blessings. So tonight we're going to look at three things that come out of this blessing and this process of blessing Ephraim and Manasseh, Jacob's sons. Three things, the supremacy of the blessings given here, the substance of the blessings given, and the stance in which the blessings are given. I don't normally do alliteration, but there, if it helps you remember... Supremacy, substance, stance. It's like any three words, though. You force them so much that you'll remember them and think, well, what did did he actually say? But stance, I think, is the one to focus on. If you want an image tonight, remember as we get to stance and take that image away with you this evening. Supremacy of blessing, substance of blessing, and stance of blessing. So first, the supremacy of the blessing we see here, that the blessing Jacob gives is greater than any other kind of of blessing. Look down again at those first couple of verses. Joseph's told by someone that his father's ill. One imagines he's very important, 
and therefore often off, off engaged in business. And so ser some servant comes and says to him, your father is not well. He's coming to the end of his life. Come and see him. So one imagines as Joseph comes that perhaps he just comes simply to say goodbye. But there seems like there's something more than that. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. He goes not on his own, but with his two sons. And it seems that what he has in mind is exactly what Jacob does. There is a meeting of minds here. Joseph brings his sons to be blessed. And Jacob literally rises to the occasion. He summons all his strength in order to bless them. Now that might seem like a reasonably minor thing. Okay, end of life. Here he brings the sons to be blessed. But think of who those children are, Ephraim and Manasseh. We don't know anything particular about them, but we know who their parents are. Think of the kind of standing. Think of the kind of people that they were in Egypt. Their mother, we're told, is, is the daughter of a priestly family. Now, that, that's not the equivalent to the vicar's daughter. That's a lady who's part of a royal priestly family. She's part of the court She's close to Pharaoh herself. She's very important. And then think of their father, the father of Ephraim Manasseh. It's Joseph. He's essentially Pharaoh's banker, Pharaoh's right hand. These are two children of two incredibly important people. If there was some swanky soiree in Egypt, Joseph and his wife would have been on the list. These are the kind of kids we talk about in, in London as being Sloanies. If you've ever, you may have probably never heard that word. Have you heard that? Sloanies. They're, they're people whose parents live in places like Sloan Square in West London. It's incredibly expensive real estate. Their parents are so wealthy, they need never work. They're on the lists for every party that you'd ever want to go to. Any bands playing in town, they're on the VIP list. They flip from one holiday to another holiday in Saint-Tropez. They're always wearing the finest clothes. They have everything. Privilege, wealth, status. That's the kind of people that Ephraim and Manasseh are in Egypt. They're the children of the wealthy. They're, they're it boys. And think what Joseph might have thought about his children as he looked at them. Look at where I've come from. Look at the backward little place I used to live. And look at where I am now, exalted in Egypt. Look at everything I can give to my children. He could have looked back at his past and thought, that silly backward place, that silly backward religion of my father's. And yet that's not at all how he thinks here, is it? He brings his children to this aging patriarch. As if he considers all the riches of Egypt as being nothing in comparison to what his father can give them. In that, he's like Moses, his later compatriot, who the writer to Hebrews says, saw that there was something far greater than the treasures of Egypt. Joseph and Moses saw that there was a better reward, a greater blessing contained in these promises given to their fathers. Joseph believed he saw, and so he took the sons for this greater blessing. And, and if you think that's speculative, oh, well, is it really greater? Does he really think, is he perhaps just taking out that kind of um, religious insurance policy? They've got wealth, they've got status, now a sprinkling of divine blessing will just round it all out. But look at the stance, this is a different stance, but look at the stance of Joseph as he comes to Jacob. What does he do when he receives the blessing? He bows before him. They prostrate themselves before Jacob. Here is the right-hand man of, of Pharaoh bowing down to an ancient Near Eastern nobody because he understands. Who has the greater kingdom? Whose is it to give the greater blessing? It's the promises through this man. As you look at Joseph here, as you look at him bring his children, I think it's a great challenge and rebuke to us. What is the blessing as Christians that we're seeking? 
We've come to Jesus. We've put our faith in him to get the great blessing promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And yet, do you do not find at times your own hearts that you behave as if there is a greater blessing in status, in privilege, or in wealth? Or if that's not something that we struggle with so much for ourselves, do we not perhaps struggle with it for our children? Or for the children in the congregation? By our manner of life, what do we portray to our children and to young people generally, is the great blessing to be sought. Joseph challenges us here with that. But as you reflect on that, as you think about that, that that issue of desiring the great blessing, if you think about it for very long, you'll see the issue of sin. Not that actually we want something greater than what God has to offer. We could think that, couldn't we? The Lord, you're offering me blessing, but I've got something greater in mind. Wealth, treasure, privilege, success. And yet the scriptures say that in in the realm of sin, it's not that we want too much. It's actually that we want too little. God is standing here in Jacob, ready to give them a great blessing. And it's as, as, it's as if we shrink back. C.S. Lewis puts it memorably like this in one of his famous sermons, The Weight of Glory. Speaking of the way in which sin constricts our hearts so that we go after things that really are comparatively less blessings. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord, that he's speaking of Jesus, finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You see, sin is for Joseph to shrink back. And to simply be happy with what he has and what he can give his children materially. And yet here is faith. Faith that presses forward to take hold of a greater blessing. But that's the problem, isn't it? The problem is to believe. The problem is to want the greater blessing that the Lord offers. And so wonderfully, as the Lord speaks here, he doesn't just show us that the blessing is greater. He shows us how it's better. He shows us the good substance of the blessing being offered through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How it is that it's so much better than what the world has to offer. As Joseph goes to see his father, he's seeking this blessing, and he finds it. Jacob rouses himself to bless him. And with a man who has little time, he cuts to the chase. Have a look at At verse 3, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. Here's the substance of the blessing many descendants, and a land of their own to live in. But there's, there's more about the blessing here. There's more that describes the blessing, and it's there if you turn, at least in my Bible, over the page. Turn, turn to verse 15, and look at the kinds of terms that Jacob uses as he pronounces this blessing on the children. The God before whom my fathers, Abraham, And Isaac walked. The God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on. And the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. You see as Jacob blesses the children. He blesses them in deeply personal terms. He blesses them in the name of the God who. 
the God he knows, the God who has done so many things for him, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long, he speaks of, the God who's ruled me and guided me and protected me and led me like a shepherd does. You see, this is not just a God in name. This is a God in his promises and in his action has bound himself to Jacob and bound himself to Jacob's own story so that as, as Jacob recounts his life and looks back here, he says, the Lord appeared to me. The Lord promised me. The Lord has shepherded me. The angel of the Lord, so closely identified here with the Lord himself, has redeemed me from all evil. I'm sure you know that kind of experience, don't you, of being perhaps thrown into a history, a story, with someone else who is a stranger. You think of those kind of documentaries you see of people who go through tragedies, like disasters of, of ships sinking, and they went onto the ship as strangers. And as they were rescued, it was like some great bond was formed between them that lasted the rest of their life. Redemption, events, story bound them together in relationship as friends. And here, the story of Jacob's life is a story of the God of the promise becoming bound up with his story. That's the way he speaks so personally, so richly. And if you think about it, it's not a surprise when you think of the story of Genesis. Ten times the Genesis says, these are the generations of somebody. These are the family histories. These are the family stories of these people. And yet also they're the story of God and his action. You see, what, the way Joseph blesses here shows that there is a blessing in the Old Testament that lies underneath every other blessing. That great promise that comes that I will be your God and you will be my people. It's the great Old Testament marriage. That God will come as a husband and take a people, a wife, for himself to be his very own. That's why the blessings here are so much greater than the world's blessings. What is the great blessing at the center of what God offers? It's God himself. It's to have this God as, as our God. And that's not something just offered to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but to us. The great news of the gospel is not first forgiveness or justification or adoption, but actually that through those blessings, the God of the universe becomes our God and we become his. God is the great blessing. What could you possibly say about that? How could you explain it or, or confirm it or, or, or speak about it? And yet Jesus speaks about it in these terms. He says, what is it like to find God as your great blessing? It's like a man who's digging in a field and finds a treasure so valuable that he goes laughing on his way and sells everything he has to buy that field. It is the pearl of great price to have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as your God. You see, as we look at the blessing here, it shows us how it is that we'll give up on the treasures and blessings of this life. How we'll be willing not to seek them as above all things. It's to be like a child who's actually been to the seaside and so doesn't want to play in slums anymore. It's to be Joseph and Jacob and his fathers who see that to have the, the God of the universe as your God is a blessing greater than any other blessing. So there's the substance of the blessing, to have God as your God. And last of all, the stance of the blessing here. 
See, perhaps the most striking aspect of this story is the issue of stance. And if it's one thing that you want to take away, an image that will stick in your mind, here it is. These crossed hands that take up so much of the second half of the passage. You see, as you read it, you, you could think to yourself, how long does it take to pronounce a blessing? Sure, the words bit take, takes a while, but Jacob, you could just read, Jacob stretched out his hands and blessed them, and it was done, and they went for cocktail sausages and a, a light refreshment. It could be done in, in, in a verse. And yet here, look, it starts in about verse 8, and it takes us all the way through to the end of the passage, verse 20 or 21. Why does it take so long? It's because the story slows down so much and is full of detail about which hand and where and exactly how they were blessed. Which might seem like technical detail, but it's key, isn't it, to the story. It's actually the key conclusion to the blessing. Verse 20, sorry, but verse 20, right at the end, then he put Ephraim before Manasseh. This is how he did it. This is how he put Ephraim before Manasseh. You see, Joseph brings the children forward, and he does it in a studied manner. His father is blind. He doesn't expect him to know where they are, and so he brings the elder child, Manasseh, in his right hand, no, in his left hand, so that he might be at Jacob's right hand. He will be the older child, Manasseh, for the greater blessing. That's the way it's going to be. And Ephraim, well, he'll get the left hand. He'll get the lesser blessing. And so he brings them and they bow and they wait for the blessing to be pronounced. And yet then, have a look at verse 14. He seems to mess it up. Jacob gets it wrong. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh which if we're not tracking is quite hard. And so they help, the text helps us crossing his hands. Now that's not the most natural of poses, is it? Can you imagine a pastor rising at the end of the service? Go in peace with his hands crossed. And Joseph says, what is this old fool doing? And seeks to grab hold of his hand and move it. No, father, this child, not that child. And yet Jacob, who can't see anything, says effectively, no, my son, I see just fine. I understand, my son. I know. Not because he can see outwardly, but because he sees what God is doing. And Joseph ought really to know, if you think about it. It might be strange for the pastor to cross his hands like that, but it, it can hardly not be on purpose. It's a purposeful kind of action. Jacob does it knowingly and on purpose because he sees that this is God's topsy-turvy way of blessing. He crosses his hands. He reverses the position because God is a God who blesses like that. We've seen it all the way through Genesis as God keeps blessing against the natural order, as twins are born, as brothers are born, and yet God blesses the younger and not the elder. Even in this story, as Joseph, who is far down the pecking order, gets lifted up to be number one. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as Mary sings her song like this. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. See, God's kingdom of blessing is upside down and back to front. And so Jacob crosses his hand and blesses the one who is less and gives the lesser blessing to the one who is more. Just like the God who justifies sinners and receives tax collectors who'd never done anything right, crossing his hands and sending those who are religiously devoted away empty. Why does God do it? It's all back to front. It's all mixed up. It's all crossed over. 
Why does he do it? Because at the center of his plans stands the Lord Jesus. Who, though he is the son of his right hand, yet at the cross got the left hand of justice. Took justice that we deserved, that God might bless with crossed hands and place all the blessing that belongs to Jesus on us. You see, Jacob really sees the way God works here and blesses them in this topsy-turvy way because God's blessing is not natural in any way. It's not the expected way written on our hearts. It's the way of grace. It's that topsy-turvy way of grace. And although it's not natural, we ought not be like Joseph and say, no, my father, that's not right. It isn't right. It's grace. It's better than that. God crosses his hands and gives to us what Christ deserves and Christ takes what we deserve. In blessing Ephraim and Manasseh then, we see that the blessing here is so much greater than anything the world has to offer. So Joseph brings his children, even though they already have everything, We see why that blessing is so much greater because it is God giving us himself as our God. And we see how he gives it to us by crossing his hands and blessing us all against what we deserve, giving us the blessing that only properly belongs to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you that you speak and uncover to us things that are far more wonderful than we could ever hope for or imagine. Lord, we ask that you might give us faith to hunger after the things that are far greater than this world has to offer. Lord, we pray that we might not have a a mercenary faith that only wants you for the blessings that you give, but we thank you that in in the spirit way that those blessings lead us to you and make us delight in you as our chief blessing. So Lord, we ask that this week you might keep us from sin by teaching us what it is to know you as our great blessing in life. But Lord, as we do sin, we pray that we might turn to you and know the grace by which you cross your hands and continue to give us every good gift against our deserts. And we thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen.